Hey everyone, welcome to the Grace and Truth broadcast. I'm your host today, Dwayne Sheriff. I'm excited about what the Lord has put on my heart, and I believe this will be a blessing to you and your family, and specifically your children and grandchildren. I'm going to be sharing on the subject of identity and identity theft and how that the enemy, Satan, is going about, if you will, seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the things that the enemy wants to steal and kill and destroy is our identity, especially now our new identity that is in Christ. And man, our culture right now is suffering immensely from an identity crisis. And I would have never dreamed that we would see the enemy be able to, if you will, steal an entire generation through an identity crisis. Our young people are being inundated at this very moment with an identity crisis. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they've come from. They don't know where they're going. And that large, they, they don't know how to get there from here. And so I'm going to be sharing on our new identity that is in Christ. But in order to understand that and the, and the full impact of the power of your identity, you have to understand the different sources that make up, if you will, our identity. And so the reason this is so important, not only for you and, and myself, but for, again, our children, is your identity connects you to your purpose. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know where you came from, if you do not have your identity secured in your creator, then you're going to miss your purpose in life. You're going to be a, unable to fulfill God's will for your life. So this is important that we know who we are and especially our new identity now in Christ because it directly connects you to your purpose. See, within your identity, you have your divine design that matches your purpose. God knew and had a plan for you and your children before the foundations of the world. He knows you. And he designed you a specific way and your identity now connects you to God's purpose for your life. And what Satan wants more than anything in all this identity confusion that's going on in our, our culture is to rob people of their purpose. You cannot fulfill your divine purpose if you don't know your divine design, which makes up now your identity. Number two, your identity sets the course for your life. It sets the course for your life. When you are suffering from an identity crisis, and boy, I suffered from an identity crisis for, for many, many years, and man, it messed up the course of my life. And then in May of 1980, I had a vision, an open vision of the cross and I saw the death of my old man in Jesus on the cross. I saw the end of an identity I was suffering from that was in Adam and my connection to Adam. And I'll explain this in detail as we go through this. But then I saw Jesus raised from the dead after the vision of the cross. And I actually saw my new identity in Christ. And it completely changed, brothers and sisters, the course of my life. Many people are, are missing, again, not only God's purpose, but the course for their life is in disarray because they don't know who they are and specifically now who they are in Christ. The third reason your identity is so important and powerful is, is it affects the wholeness of your personhood. Until you discover your new identity in Christ, till you come to a revelation of your old identity in Adam and the death of that identity and the, and the end of that identity through the cross, and then the discovery of your new identity in Christ and through the resurrection, then you're going to suffer in your wholeness and in your personhood. Man, when you look at people today, it is so sad 
Their, their lives are again without purpose, in total disarray. The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He has stolen their identity in Christ. He has absolutely destroyed their identity, and, and now there is absolute disarray in their lives. This is what I experienced before I had a revelation of the cross, before I had a revelation of my new identity. All right, what is our identity? Your identity is who you are or who you believe yourself to be. <laughs> Your identity is who you are or who you believe yourself to be. The dictionary says about identity, the distinguishing character or personality of a person. It's a part of your character, your, is your identity. It's a part of your personality. That's a part of your identity, identity and your individuality. Your identity is, is connected and established by psychological identifications. I need that to sink in for a minute. Your identity is established by psychological identifications. There are things that you and I identify with that we have identifications with that make up and shape our identity. And many times the things we identify with, uh, you can't separate those things from your, from your identity. We see this throughout history and, and throughout even, even the church and the power, again, of your, of your identity. When you think of Martin Luther, he had an identification that shaped his identity, and that was the Reformation. You can't separate Martin Luther and, and the Reformation any more than you can separate Martin Luther King Jr. from, if you will, the Civil Rights Movement. Martin Luther King Jr. had an identification that was associated so closely with the civil rights movement, it shaped his identity. So you have to be aware of all these different identifications that you are identifying with that are shaping your, your identity. Identification means to treat or consider the same. Identification... And what are our identification markers, if you will? Because you can't hardly separate your identity from the things that you're identifying with. And so when you think of identification, it means to treat or consider the same. It means to make identical or simil similar, to join or associate with closely. It means sameness or oneness. Again, you can't say civil rights movement and disconnect that to Martin Luther King Jr. You can't, you can't say John and Charles Wesley and separate them from the, the Methodist church. They had an identification, the Methodist church, that shaped their, their, their identity. And on and on we could go. You know, the young people talk about the basketball stars of today, and I don't want to diss any of the young people, or even my kids or grandkids especially. But man, there was nobody like Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan and basketball are identical. You can't separate Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player ever, from basketball itself. Basketball and his identification with basketball shaped his, shaped his identity. They, they are treated the same, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When you say Tiger Woods, there's an identification that should come to your mind immediately when I say Tiger Woods, and that's golf. You can't separate Tiger Woods from golf. There's an identification that he has that shaped his identity. Well, brothers and sisters, we have a new identity and a new person that we're to be identified with, and that's Jesus. And yet most people separate the church and our new identification with Jesus. Jesus has identified with us as a member of his body. Jesus is the head of the church and we are the church, which is his body. You can't separate 
Jesus from His church. Nor should we be separating the church from Jesus. There's an identification that we have with Jesus where we are treated the same and associated with. You can't separate us. Jesus is the head. On the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus had papers from the high priest to persecute, to, to prosecute anyone who was of what he called the way at that time, the way, which was Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. And he had this encounter with Jesus and Jesus in his resurrected glory literally blinded him, physically blinded him. But he saw the Lord and he heard the Lord and the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? And, and Saul said, well, who art thou? He knew it was the Lord because as a trained Pharisee, any unapproachable light was God in their minds. And so here's this unapproachable light that blinds him. A voice comes out of the unapproachable light and asks him, why do you persecute me? Well, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Now think about that. Jesus had an identification with the church that you couldn't separate it. They were the same. They were treated the same. Saul of Tarsus had never met Jesus after the flesh and after his three and a half years of, of ministry in Jerusalem and the surrounding towns. And he heard of Jesus. He knew of Jesus but he thought Jesus was a heretic and anyone who followed Jesus was involved in heresy. And so now he gets this rude awakening that he's persecuting Jesus. But if you think about it, he was persecuting the church. If you go back to Acts chapter 8, he was persecuting the church. He held the coats of those that stoned Stephen literally to death. And, and so Jesus took it personally. He didn't say, and he could have said, why do, you, why do you persecute me, the Messiah? That would have been true. Me, the resurrected Lord. Uh, all those would have been true statements. But why did he say, why do you persecute me? He was showing Saul, who now after his conversion became the Apostle Paul, that to, to persecute the church is to persecute Jesus, that Jesus is so identified with the church and we have such an identity in Christ, we are now flesh of his flesh, bone of his, of his bones. We are the body of Christ on earth. That's an identification. That's a new identity that when you get born again, you didn't just get forgiven of your sins, even though, praise God, we all got totally, completely forgiven of all our sins. We got united in spirit to Jesus Christ. And in that identification with Jesus, we have a new identity. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, and our new identity is absolutely blessed and overcomers and victors, not victims. And on and on I can go and I will go with our new identity and our new identification in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the New Living Translation says, Do not or don't be fooled by those, those who say such things. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Once you get born again, brothers and sisters, you have to be renewed in your mind to your new identity, your new identification with Christ and, and with His resurrection. Or, or if you keep identifying with this world and the things of this world and the philosophies of this world, it's going to corrupt 
your good manners. It's going to corrupt your character. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, the New Living Translation says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. Amen. You have to teach your young people and we have to communicate to our grandchildren that who you identify with will shape your own personal identity. And that if you'll walk with wise men, if you'll identify with wise men, then, then you will become wise. It will, it will shape your character. But if you identify with fools, if you continue to, to have an identification with the things of this world, then it'll lead to trouble. It will affect you in a negative manner. That's why identity is so important, and it's so important that every believer understands your old identity and the death of it in Christ and your new identity in the resurrection of Christ and that you be renewed in your mind and have all these new identifications that ultimately, again, will shape your identity. Well, I'm going to be diving into this in much detail over the next few episodes. And I just want to give a quick testimonial that in May of 1980, I was uh, transitioning from my junior year in college to my senior year in college. And I was playing tennis for the University of Central Florida. And I taught tennis. I played tennis every day. Tennis was my focus. Tennis was my, my purpose in life, my goal. Everything was, was centered around tennis. And I had a, a practice court at a place called the Haystacks, the Haystacks Apartments. And Sue, who is now my wife, who wasn't, of course, my wife then, moved into the Haystack Apartments, and her apartment was right over the tennis courts. And so she would hear me teaching tennis. She would be coming and going uh, and seeing me at all hours practicing um, I practice every day for a minimum of six hours a day, as much as 10 hours a day, every day, never missed a day for a, one year. I made it 365 days. I had an indoor court and I was just committed, obsessed. And my identification was with a tennis racket and the game of tennis. It was shaping my identity. And so anyway, I met Sue and the Lord spoke to Sue that she would witness to me. And, and so she prayed that the Lord would give her an opportunity to minister to me, to witness to me. I was at the time in a backslidden condition, and that just takes too long to, to explain. I have other books that I go into detail on how I got to where I was in my backslidden condition. But suffice to say now, I was not serving the Lord. I was not seeking the Lord. He was not on my radar any longer. I had basically failed in serving God, and I just believed I was flawed. And the bottom line is I gave up on God. And I didn't give up on God as God, but I gave up on me as serving God. And the Lord spoke to Sue and said she would witness to me. And so sure enough, our paths crossed, and I just asked her to play tennis. Would she like to play tennis uh, and I won't, I won't say what I said. Again, I was in a, black, a, back, a backslidden condition, and I, I said something I shouldn't have said. It wasn't polite. But Sue overlooked it, being full of the Holy Spirit as she was, and uh, anyway agreed to, to play tennis one afternoon. And so we got out on the court, and she had told me she couldn't play tennis. And brothers and sisters, my wife has never lied. <laughs> <laughs> this woman could not play tennis. I had never seen anything like it. She could not hit the ball. It was just amazing. Uh, and so I'm running after balls. I would hit it over the net. She would knock it over the fence. It would bounce off of the apartments behind me and all kinds of things. The tennis ball would wind up in the parking lot going down into the main traffic. It was terrible. And so anyway, I was running after tennis balls, and I just got thirsty, and I asked her, could we get a drink? I knew her apartment was right there. And so we went up to get a drink. And uh, man, as soon as I walked into her apartment, I knew, uh-oh, uh, I'm in trouble. This is a committed Christian. 
This is a Christian woman, and uh, I'm not good for her. <laughs> I knew I was away from God, and I could tell by all the pictures. I could tell by the magazines that she's a committed Christian. Everything is testifying all around me of her commitment to Christ, and so I'm thinking, well, I need to go. I, I don't need to have anything to do with this girl. And so I asked her, could I use her restroom? And she said, absolutely. And so I went into her restroom in her apartment. And brothers and sisters, there was a, a Bible on the back of the toilet. Man, who, who has a Bible on the back of the toilet? And so I'm just freaking out. I'm thinking, I have to get out of here. Uh, this is not good. And so I came out of the the, the bathroom and I made up an excuse that I have to go uh, and, and, and I lied. I wasn't as holy as Sue. I basically lied and said, hey, I, I need to go shower. Uh, she began to try to witness to me and wanted to talk to me uh, and, and I just knew I had to leave. And, and so I promised I would come back, but I didn't intend on coming back. And so I left, I went home and, and took a shower. I'd been practicing all that day. And so anyway, I was just intrigued by how that this girl thought that she could witness to me and convince me of God's love for me. And I thought, there is no way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna prove to her that I'm flawed. I'm gonna prove to her that I have messed up too much, that I have fallen too many times I had such a heart for God. I got saved in, in uh, 1965, and, and I had tried to serve the Lord up into my, my late teens, and it just failed so many times and, and sinned that I, I thought that, that God wasn't pleased with me, and how could He be? And again, I thought I was flawed. So I'm going to convince her that I'm too far gone. And man, I got back to her apartment. Uh, I began to share you know, all of my failures, all of my shortcomings. And she kept telling me how much God loved me. And she kept telling me how forgiven I already am, how that Jesus died on the cross for all my sins, all my sins, not some of my sins, not part of my sins, all of my sins, that it is impossible for me to commit a sin that Jesus did not die for on the cross. And brothers and sisters, it was probably the first time in my life that I heard the gospel, that I heard the message of grace, that Jesus didn't die for some of my sins, most of my sins, or my past sins. Jesus died for all of my sins, of my sins past tense, present tense, and even future tense sins. And I can remember after I even got in the ministry and I began to share this good news, how that people just couldn't understand, how can God forgive a sin before you commit it. Well, that just shows you how we do not know the cross and when Jesus died for our sins. Jesus died for our sins 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, He hung on a cross and God put all of our sins in the body of Jesus, condemned Jesus, punished Jesus for our sins, and He died literally our death. I'll get into detail in this as these episodes, episodes evolve. The bottom line is, man, I heard the gospel for the first time and realized I'm 2,000 years future tense. Jesus died for my sins before I was born, before I ever committed a sin. He died for them and rose for my justification. And so, man, I'm going to have to pick up this testimonial in the next broadcast. I'm running out of time but I'll share with you how Sue witnessed to me and how I had an open vision of the cross. I just want to encourage you. I'm going to be sharing out of my first book entitled Identity Theft. Identity Theft. And the subtitle of this book, Identity Theft, is Satan's Greatest Crime Against Humanity. The greatest crime and assault that Satan has committed against humanity is the stealing of our identity. Adam lost a lot in the garden, but one of the main things he lost was his identity. He lost his focus on where do I discover who I am, where I came from, where I'm going in life, why I'm here. We discover all of that in our Creator God, and sin is what separated Adam 
from his creator God, and he began to try to find his identity horizontally instead of vertically in God. And I go over identity theft and how that Satan robbed us, but Jesus Christ has recovered our identity in the resurrection. We're offering the first two chapters of identity theft absolutely free. We, we want to get this material out desperately. I believe that this is vital in this hour for you, for your children. It's called identity theft. And if you'll call the ministry or you'll email us, we'll get you the first two chapters absolutely free so you can get a taste of the, of the book. Again, you can contact us at pastordwayne.com, pastordwayne.com, or you can call us at area code 580-4043. Is it 76? My goodness. My phone number is area code 580-4043-376. It's DSM, and I hope that's 376. But if you'll call... Uh, it will make sure we correct this on the screen if I missed it. But again, we'll give you the first two chapters absolutely, absolutely free. Well, I appreciate you watching today. I'm looking forward to our next episode where I'll share my vision of the cross. God bless you. Hey, we want to take a moment to say thank you to our impact partners for your generosity. It's because of your partnership that we're able to continue to give away Dwayne's teachings completely free. To become a partner, you can visit our website or call the number on the screen. Thanks so much for your generosity and for taking part in our mission to help people grow in Christ. Dwayne Sheriff's book, Identity Theft, is crucial for our world today. People are so confused about who they are and what their purpose is. This book helps uncover the lies the world uses to keep us from discovering our true identity. Dwayne also shares his own life story and his personal journey to discovering who he is in Christ. You can order this book on our website or by calling the number below. Take this opportunity to get your copy of Identity Theft today. Thanks so much for watching. All of our content is available for free because of the generous donations from partners of Dwayne Sheriff Ministries. Visit our website, pastordwayne.com, to find the full message series and to learn how you can help partner with us. We hope you enjoyed this message.